Before there was sin, was the earth a paradise with no death, decay, or suffering? Many advocate this is what Genesis 1 is teaching. But is this actually what the text is saying, or is this a modern misreading of scripture through Western eyes? Many read this phrase in Genesis 1 and assume it is referring to the idea creation was perfect and lacked decay and death. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But this might be a leap in logic. The Hebrew word for good functions much like how our English word good functions. It can mean multiple things depending on the context. For example, if I said God is good, and my car is good, it would obviously be understood the word good implies a different meaning in each context. In the first, I'm referring to God being a perfect moral being, and in the second, I'm only saying my car functions properly. The Hebrew word functions the same way, and doesn't necessarily mean something is perfect, lacking sin and death. In some places, it only means beautiful, a satisfying age to die, a pleasant place in Canaan, a suitable calf, and many other examples. Just like with the English word, the Hebrew word is to be understood in regards to the context of how it is used. So the question we need to ask is, is how is it used in Genesis 1? There is no indication it is used to mean a perfect, deathless, blissful creation. In fact, given the overall claims of Genesis 1, as we went over in part 1, this doesn't seem to be the aim of the authors, since they are more focused on how God assigned functions and gave purpose to the cosmos. In fact, if we look in Genesis 2, we can see how the word was understood in the opening chapters of Genesis, and it is actually more in line with the functional understanding of Genesis 1. Genesis 2.18 says, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. The Hebrew term is signifying that man is not functioning properly alone and will not work the garden properly without a woman by his side. As John Walton says, This verse has nothing to do with moral perfection or quality of workmanship. It is a comment concerning function. The human condition is not functionally complete without the woman. Thus, throughout Genesis 1, the refrain, it was good, expressed the functional readiness of the cosmos for human beings. Readers were assured that all functions were operating well and in accord with God's purposes and direction. So given what we covered in part one of this series, in the immediate context of Genesis 2, when Genesis 1 speaks of God's work being good, he is noting how it now works as it should and is no longer functionless. As Abraham Kuruvilla says, good signifies optimal function, thus the not good the first such state in scripture indicates less than optimal function. Or as John Hill says, the word good refers to the value, purpose, or function of something. This shows the fact that the item in question fulfills its intended purpose. In other words, the light of day one fulfilled its function. So there is no explicit indication calling creation very good meant that it lacks suffering, decay, and death. On top of that, we actually do have a strong indication that at least death and suffering already existed and were part of the commands from God. Joshua John Van E. wrote a dissertation called Death in the Garden, where he looked specifically at the commands God gave humans at the end of Genesis 1. Young Earth creationists tend to focus on verse 29, where God says he has given humans every plant yielding seed and fruit for food. However, Van E takes note of the prior verse, where humans are called to subdue and have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and all living things on the earth. The words in Hebrew for subdue and dominion have stronger connotations than we realize. After a close study of these verses, it will be shown that notions of vegetarianism and animal peace do not arise from the text itself. Instead, humankind's call to subdue and rule in Genesis 1, 28-30 indicates the presence of some form of strife and most likely allows the use of animals as a food source. Thus, these texts align with the general view seen elsewhere in the biblical record 
eating meat is a blessing. The first word for subdue occurs 13 other times in the Bible. In six instances, it refers to war conquest of hostile lands. Five times, it refers to enslavement. Once it is used as a locution for sexual assault, and one other time it refers to trampling underfoot. The second word for roll is also very harsh. Vanny notes that throughout the Bible, the word is not used for someone ruling over his own people, unless that role involves some sort of oppression or injustice. The connotations of the word refers to a rulership where those that are being ruled over end up in an unpleasant situation. In other words, the end game for animals is not a pleasant one, resulting in enslavement and death. As Van E says, they focus on gaining and exerting authority over another, a call to conquest and dominion. In them, humans are granted permission to use animals for their purposes. So animals were given for full use to mankind, and this would make sense with the language of the verse. It makes sense to speak of subduing and ruling over specific animals, used in domestication. But how do we rule over and make a conquest against the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and all the additional beasts of the land? The implication is, in an ancient setting, that we can slaughter and use the wild animals as well. And the only way people used non-domesticated animals was for food. So the passage seems to give all animals to mankind for their use, then notes vegetables and fruit have been given as food in addition to being given the usage of animals. As Pete Van Dyke says, The immediate context of the Hebrew words subdue, repress, and rule, tread on, cannot be softened in any way. Even Tucker acknowledged that the term subdue is a potentially violent verb, referring to trampling under one's feet and absolute subjugation. The same word is used in Joel 4.13 for treading a wine press. Now before we assume animal cruelty is at play, we have to remember this verse should also be understood in light of the later context of the Pentateuch. Later in places like Exodus and Deuteronomy, the provision to eat animals is also restated, but it is done so in the context of treating animals with respect and even preventing extinction. What is likely happening in Genesis 1 is probably nothing more than the allotment to consume and use animals. But given the laws of the Pentateuch, this does not imply animal torture or cruelty would be allowed. Also, I want to address a theological issue some people might have about the future kingdom. Many may not like the idea that we were given the allotment to use and eat animals. But we need to remember God's relationship with humanity has been progressive. For example, Jesus taught the law of divorce was allowed under the Mosaic law because their hearts were hard. But that was a temporary fix due to the sinful state of humanity, and it is not what God intended for the future kingdom. Likewise, it is entirely possible after the resurrection we will have no more need to consume animals, and the right to eat animal flesh is a temporary allotment to deal with where we currently are spiritually. Either way, the Hebraic syntax of Genesis 1 strongly implies humans were allowed to enslave and kill animals, even if it is just a temporary right. But that is something we will have to wait and see. The second implication of this verse is creation is still in need of subjugation. If the earth was originally a paradise with no pain or suffering, why would God command humans to make a warlike conquest on his perfect realm? Such a call would only be required if creation was still wild and untamed and was in need of proper mastery. The idea God gives to humans in Genesis 1 is creation is not in the state of perfection, and we are called by God to go out and tame it. As Thomas Kaiser says, the utilization of subdue implies that the earth needs to be subdued, thus logically creating the impression that something with creation required such action. But this notion goes against the nearly universal presumption that God's creation was perfect in the sense of being unimprovable or finished. However, the characterization of creation is not as something which is unimprovable and finished, but rather is still requiring further action or development. Thus, as Terence E. Freitheim notes, the call in verse 28 is for mankind to partner with God in transforming the disordered cosmos into an ordered state. Simply put, God did not create a perfect planet for his pet humans to never suffer or get their hands dirty, but specifically gave mankind a higher calling to join God 
in his effort to subdue and bring order to the chaotic cosmos. This fits with one of the major themes of the whole Bible, especially in the New Testament, where Jesus calls on us to fulfill the Great Commission, not sit on the safety of the sidelines and let him fix all our problems. God's will and destiny for mankind has always been to partner with us in the work that needs to be done. It was not originally the plan to baby us in a safe garden where we never had to think or work hard. This fits strongly with the idea of what it means to be the image of God. I did a specific video on this topic, but I'll address it again here briefly. A lot of modern people assume being made in the image of God is a specific ontological status or material creation, but this was not so in the ancient world. For example, there is no ontological distinction between humans and animals in the Bible. Both are said to be flesh, a nephesh, have a spirit, and are made with the same verbs. And Ecclesiastes 3 says man is a beast of the field. So the Bible never distinguishes any ontological differences between man and animals. Second, as we have noted in the previous video of this series, the word bara most likely relates to electing or giving proper functions to. So God barad man in his image or elected him for a specific purpose, namely to have dominion over the earth, enter into a covenant with him and work alongside him. Michael Heiser notes, the Hebrew syntax of Genesis 1 26 to 27 more likely is understood as verb dominated. In other words, the idea is that God called us to image him. Heiser puts it like this, if we think of imaging as a verb or function, that translation makes sense. We are created to image God, to be his imagers. It is what we are by definition. The image is not an ability we have, but a status. We are God's representatives on earth. To be human is to image God. Much to our surprise, this is actually a radical idea that was attacking the surrounding cultures of the day. John Walton notes in the ancient Near East, it was the king who was seen as elevated above the rest of humanity to function as the image of the gods. However, Genesis 1 contradicts this prejudice idea and claims all humans are the image of the creator, men and women. All are equal representatives of God. J. Richard Middleton says, When the clues within the Genesis text are taken together with comparative studies of the ancient Near East, they lead to what we could call a functional or even missional interpretation of the image of God in Genesis 1 27 in contradistinction to substantialistic or relational interpretations. On this reading, the Imago Dei designates the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world, granted authorized power to share in God's rule or administration of the earth's resources and creatures. This idea of humans being God's image also relates to the temple inauguration view of Genesis 1. In typical ancient Near Eastern temple constructions, after the temple was completed, the graven image of the deity was brought in. Likewise, in Genesis 1 after the temple is constructed and before God takes residence in the cosmic temple, the image of God is installed. But here, it is all mankind. This is probably another polemic against the surrounding pagan cultures. The dead and weak pagan deities need dumb and useless idols in their temples. But the living God who has created the whole cosmos to be his temple, has no need for such useless idols. The living God has a living image throughout his temple. Mark Smith says, In Genesis 1, 26-28, this vocabulary may represent an implicit polemic aimed against the making of images. Clearly humanity serves as the living image of the Israelite deity. And it is perhaps implicit then that images of man-made objects constitute lifeless symbols of dead gods. In fact, scholars debate if there are other implicit polemics at play in Genesis 1. For example, the sun and moon are called the greater and lesser lights. This seems an odd choice of words until we realize the terms sun and moon in the ancient world were synonymous with the names for the deities they were said to be. The authors of Genesis 1 refuse to even acknowledge these deities 
are behind these celestial objects, and note they are just lights governed by the only God worth acknowledging. God is also given the power that other cultures said their deities had. Instead of Marduk dividing the waters, it is the Lord. Instead of Ta speaking things into existence, it is the Lord. Instead of Ishtar providing fertility, the command and provision comes from the Lord. Genesis 1 may have been a direct attack on the pagan cultures of the day in order to proclaim that it was the God of Israel that did these things by himself. The point is, no deity can ever compare to the greatness of the Lord. In fact, that is the main theme the authors of Genesis 1 are trying to tell us. They are proclaiming the Lord as the only God who can govern the cosmos and no other deity is worth acknowledging. It is the Lord who is the only God who reigns and all mankind is called to image him. He has established a cosmic temple over all creation and mankind has been called to his side in bringing order to the cosmos. This theme continues in the next chapter, Genesis 2.